Good evening. This is Current Issues, and I am Hisham Talawi, coming to you live from the AOC studios in downtown Lafayette, Louisiana. Welcome to the program, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, again, we are going to have a busy night. In the first hour, we will be speaking with Summer Dohmas Jarrah. Summer is a Palestinian American. She was born in Kuwait. She has worked in, uh, jo in jo with Jordan Television as a reporter and news editor. She also uh, worked with uh, and contributed to CNN World's Report. And uh, we will speak with Summer uh, in the first hour. Uh, she, Summer had written a book, and her book is Arab Voices Speak to American Hearts. We will speak with uh, Summer about her book, but uh, in the beginning, Let's catch up on a couple of things in the news. We have watched the, uh, with the, what's going on with the Arab uh, ports. Okay, this is a copy of uh, what uh, a, a cover page for uh, Summer's book. But before we go and talk about the book, uh, let's talk about this Arab deal. We talked about it last time. And unfortunately, there is uh, somebody somewhere is not getting the picture and is not getting the point here because it seems like uh, somebody's not telling the truth about this deal. Now, unfortunately, the majority of Americans see in this deal as a security breach, and it is really not. It is not a security breach, but the media has decided, and the politicians have decided, to capitalize on this uh, Dubai port uh, world, purchasing six terminals in the United States. And they're not this company is not purchasing the port. They are purchasing a company called Peninsula and Oriental Navigation Company. And actually, what this company does, it unloads and, uh, and uh, loads up ships. They're not responsible for security. And like we talked about last time, it is not going to be like you're going to have uh, Arabs controlling these ports. It is not. Uh, the port control rests with the municipality that that port is, is in. And actually, it's not even a federal property, it's a state property. Now, it is security, uh, it's, it's controlled by the United States Coast Guard, uh, customs, by, uh, you know, homeland security. But why I don't like this deal? You know, I, I don't, really don't like this deal myself, but not for the same reasons that you were programmed to dislike this particular deal. And I'll tell you why. Whenever I hear Rush Limbaugh defending the deal, that's when I start worrying. Because Rush Limbaugh has been on the airwaves defending this deal and knowing that Rush Limbaugh has been for the last 17 years, actually more than that, 16 years, 17, 18 years, doing nothing but criticizing and spewing hate and negativity about Muslims and Arabs. And all of a sudden to have a change of heart and start speaking and defending this company that is buying PNA and O, that makes me start wondering, okay, what's going on here? And actually, what I found out with the deal is the Arabs were sucked into buying this deal. They paid $6.8 billion for a company that made 154 million, uh, uh, 153, $154 million in 2005, 2004. Now, anybody who knows anything about a, a business, this is not worth $6.8 billion. This is probably worth about $1.5 billion at the most. This is what the company has been doing. In the year 2000, they made 102 million. In 2004, they made 153.8 million. So it is not like within the last five years, it's not like it really uh, had a huge, uh, you know, to, to, to offset. Now remember, this company was purchased by the British company for less than a billion dollars just a few years back. Somebody is making a lot of money on this deal and somebody inflated the price on the stock of this, uh, of this deal that made this Dubai company get basically screwed when they 
purchased this deal. Now, who's benefiting from this? Well, I always told you on this show, any time, any time you have something, you have a problem, you want to you wanna ask the question, who's benefiting? Well, who's making all the money? Well, number one, the one who had uh, lobbied for this is Bob Doyle, the ex-senator, the ex-presidential candidate. He's the one that lobbied on behalf of the, uh, the Dubai company. Who else behind that? Well, if you, if you see and you go and investigate who is making profits out of this, who are the investors of P&O, you will find that, believe it or not, many Israeli companies. The chairman, Lord somebody, I forgot his name, in England, he's a Zionist, a well-known Zionist. Some of the investors in this company, ladies and gentlemen, is Paul Wolfowitz and, and, and Richard Perrell. Shertoff had lobbied for this to go on because he has interest in Zim's shipping out of Israel, who is a major investor in P&O company that purchased this deal a few years back for, for less than a billion dollars, and now they're selling it for $6.8 billion. Now, we put the chart on the, uh, uh, on the screen, and you have seen how much money this company made. 153, you can see it right here, right now, in front of you. 153 million dollars. To purchase it for 6.8 billion dollars? What kind of a business sense is that? Now I know why Rush Limbaugh is defending this deal. Because his friend want to have the money. Who's his friend? You do know that he is a personal friend, very close friend with Netanyahu. He's very close friends with Netanyahu. Now, do you see who's behind this deal and who's making the money? The Arabs got sucked in. You know what the Arabs will do? They should use this, the negativity that's going on in here, to get out of the deal because this deal is not good for them. Why I don't like the deal? Because, number one, it's not good for Arabs to be, you know, to suck them to buy in something that is not worth the money. That makes them feel like, look like, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Number two, as an Arab, I don't want this deal because if anything happens, it's going to be blamed on the Arabs. Then the Zionists would have had caught two birds in one stone. They made money on the deal, and now we have something, to blame, uh, something else to blame on the Arabs. That's why I don't like the deal. The deal, and that's why, now you know why George Bush is defending the deal. Shertoff is defending, defending the deal because a major investor is an Israeli company. We're talking about billions of dollars here, ladies and gentlemen. Billions of dollars. Now, okay. Um, one thing about uh, the president, and uh, then we will go. By the way, I don't want any phone calls in the first hour for the port deal, because we're going to be speaking with uh, Summer about her book. But we're going to tackle, and we will talk about the, uh, the port deals, if any of you want to talk about it in the second hour. But uh, George Bush popularity is going down big time and fast. The latest poll, what rating would you give Bush or Bush overall performance? 76% said poor. 76% of Americans think the president is doing a poor job. What rating would you give Cheney's overall performance? Again, 76% give poor. And by the way, I am expecting Cheney to resign before the end of this year. What, which, issues, which issue has hurt them the most? War in Iraq, 64% of you think war of Iraq, uh, on, uh, in Iraq is um, actually war on Iraq, I might say, that actually hurt the president and his administration. United States ports deal got 14%. It was second. And, um, you know, hurricane response, seven. Of course, you know, the hurricane response, all of you have seen the latest videos. And you know now that the president knew about it before it happened. And he knew about it before the levy uh, broke and was damaged. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, now, what we're going to do, let me uh, again introduce uh, Samar Jarrah. Uh, Samar uh, Dhamas Jarrah is a Kuwait-born Palestinian-American speaker, journalist, and educator. She has traveled extensively throughout North America, Europe, and the Middle East, and has lived in Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and America. 
Her professional accomplishments include being a contributor to CNN World Report, news editor and reporter for Jordan Television, editor and reporter for Jordan Weekly, and a political science instructor at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. These experiences have allowed her to see the Middle East conflict from many different viewpoints. After the World Trade Center tragedy of September 11, 2001, uh, Summer Jarrah, an American citizen who lives in Florida, was asked by many community organizations, churches, and uh, temples and peace groups to speak about the Arab world. These events and the Iraq war served as the inspiration for Arab Voices Speak to American Hearts. That's the name of uh, the book that Summer had written. And we are going to uh, speak with Summer and uh, see exactly what, uh, what her book is all about and what she uh, wishes to accomplish. Good evening, Summer. Hi, Hussein. How are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight, Summer. Um, uh, you, your book, uh, you know, the, the title, I mean, it's like it seems to me that are you giving up on American minds that you're going straight to their hearts? I mean, are American minds being programmed beyond reprogramming? I mean, is that what I get out of the title? No, actually, because I believe uh, that, uh, that uh, Americans have uh, a big heart. Uh, I never failed uh, in the past 16 and a half years uh, when I do public speaking or give lectures on uh, the history of the Arab world or the Middle East or Islam. Uh, it is so easy to reach uh, Americans and so easy to make them understand the Arab perspective of events or the Muslim perspective of events. So really I wanted the Arab voices that are really missing from the current debate in the USA uh, to reach directly to the American hearts. I believe in the hearts more than the minds. Okay. Now, tell me about, you know, the idea to write this book. Um, how did it come about? Well, uh, as I told you, Hisham, I have been involved with uh, public speaking uh, since uh, I came to this country. And the interest and the demand is always uh, on uh, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans to talk about their culture or uh, politics or religion. And how many people can I reach in 16 and a half years? I reached uh, thousands, but still I wanted to reach uh, much more. And uh, after September 11, uh, I started uh, to notice that uh, most of the time I am answering on behalf of Arabs. I'm not answering uh, as an Arab American or as an American myself. Uh, most of the time people in America were asking me about how the Arabs perceive things or thought of things. So I thought, well, maybe it's, um, it's, it's time uh, to find a way to let the Arabs and Americans have a dialogue, a direct way of talking to each other. So what I did uh, was um, send an email to all the Americans that I know, and I asked them if you had a, qu a chance to ask an Arab a question, what would it be? And please send this email to anybody uh, on your email list. And I ended up with uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, emails uh, with uh, many, many uh, questions that I took to Jordan, Egypt, and Kuwait and gave it to Arabs and said, this is your chance to answer the Americans. These are the questions that are on their minds. This is what they really want to know. And here is your chance to talk to them directly without propaganda, without media borders or restrictions. Okay. Um, so what did you do? You went um, to, to write the book. You traveled throughout the Middle East and interviewed people. No, what I did uh, was uh, go to uh, Egypt, uh, where geographically it would represent North Africa, uh, and then to Kuwait, uh, which represents, let's say, the, um, geographically speaking, uh, the Gulf region, and then Jordan of uh, Greater Syria. And uh, as randomly as possible, uh, I uh, picked uh, about 12 people uh, who uh, uh, became uh, the, uh, uh, the voices uh, of the Arabs. So uh, you have uh, old and young uh, professionals, um, retired people, uh, Christian, uh, Muslim, uh, one Shia in my book. So you have a variety of uh, men and women 
who address uh, these questions and issues that were raised by Americans. So you end up uh, really talking to 12 people, you know their background, their family life, uh, their uh, professional life, uh, their ideas, aspirations, and their perspective on very difficult issues that the Americans uh, raised. So, I mean, so, what are some of the questions you ask the people? Um, some of the questions that the Americans asked me to ask the people are, uh, for instance, why do you hate us? Uh, is Osama bin Laden uh, truly religious or does he use religion for political ends? Uh, have you heard of uh, Jesus Christ? Uh, do Muslims believe non-Muslims should be converted to Islam? Do you think uh, that uh, there is uh, a hope for the East and the West to find uh, common ground? Uh, questions, for instance, uh, when I went, it was before the recent elections, so people were asking what the Arabs thought of Bush, of the Iraq War, of Kerry, uh, Abu Ghraib, um, many, many issues related to gender, to politics. Uh, many asked about the Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, if it is the cause uh, of uh, Arab okay. animosity. So if, if you were to summarize, Summer, if you were to summarize the answers, I mean, like if you were to say these are the three top results that everybody uh, agreed on, what would those be? The first one is uh, that both Americans and Arabs uh, are interested in having uh, a direct dialogue. They don't know how, but they both, uh, uh, at least the people that uh, sent me the questions and the people who answered, they believe that uh, there are so many barriers uh, for these two people to get to know each other, and they would, uh, they both like the idea of the book, but again, they are looking for ways to talk directly to each other. The second most important conclusion uh, is that uh, the Arabs do not uh, hate the American people. They totally disagree with U.S. foreign policy. So if there is any animosity on the side of Arabs, it's not directed uh, towards the average American. Uh, it is directed towards U.S. Uh, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the question of Palestine, vis-a-vis -vis the invasion of Iraq, vis-a-vis -vis every uh, 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 political issue uh, related to the politics of the Middle East. Now, when you, so, say, when you instance, say animosity uh, towards America, do you mean animosity towards America? What, what do you mean by America? Do you mean the government or do you mean the people or do you mean everybody in general? No, no, not the people, not the average uh, American uh, like yourself, for instance. It's against the U.S. foreign policy uh, in per se. Uh, so who is uh, responsible uh, and behind the U.S. foreign policy? It's uh, usually the government and the people in power. So they did not specify, oh, we don't like Bush. Uh, Bush happens to be the president uh, at, this, uh, at this time. But they see that U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arab world started long before the President Bush. They didn't see it any better under Clinton or Nixon or uh, any of the previous uh, presidents. So there is uh, uh, critical, uh, uh, a lot of criticism towards U.S. foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world and everything that is related to that part of the region. They don't see the U.S. playing a fair game uh, uh, in many, many uh, aspects. Now, if you would uh, to name like one thing that is a, the, the, the most misunderstood between Americans towards Arabs and Arabs towards Americans, what would that one misconception be? I think, uh, oh gosh, that's a difficult question because there isn't one thing, but I think there is total ignorance of the history of the Arab world in general. I was uh, by chance giving a lecture yesterday in uh, Siesta Key in, uh, in Sarasota uh, in Florida and people had no clue, for instance, of the, uh, the consequences of the Ottoman Empire uh, on the Arabic uh, politics, uh, the Sykes-Pico Agreement, the Belfort Declaration, uh, the creation of the State of Israel in the heart of the Arab uh, world. Uh, they don't know, for instance, how the Cold War was played uh, uh, over the Arab countries, uh, each uh, camp uh, creating uh, spheres of interest uh, at certain uh, countries. So they, they watch TV uh, for six, 
seconds and they assume, oh gosh, Arabs wake up in the morning because their moms tell them you need to hate Americans or blow yourselves up. There is no historical context whatsoever uh, to the history of the Arab world and how it has been invaded and colonized by so many people uh, because either of its geographic location through oil or because of uh, oil after it was uh, discovered. So there is a t total disconnect now, when it comes to historical uh, information on the Arab world, and this is where uh, the Americans misunderstand Arabs. And it really doesn't take much, uh, Hisham, if you have done public speaking. It takes uh, a map, uh, an hour or two to explain history to them, and then all of a sudden everything falls into place and Americans start to realize that uh, the government is not uh, being very fair uh, in dealing with the uh, 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 policies uh, these the, the Arab world, the Arab Israeli conflict, oil politics, uh, supporting undemocratic systems in the Arab world, and they start to understand all that. On the Arab side, the Arabs understand America in terms of black and white also. They don't understand many of the people that uh, America uh, has many uh, lobby uh, groups and has uh, many interests and complex, and the decision making is at, uh, complex and you cannot just uh, explain it uh, in, a, in simple terms. And uh, I think they need, on both uh, sides, they need to understand the politics of the other uh, much better. But if there is one sore uh, point or uh, something that really kept uh, coming up uh, with my 12 people, whether they are young or old, uh, Muslim or Christian, is the question of Palestine. I was very surprised because I thought really it would be Iraq, uh, it would be Afghanistan, the September 11, uh, the war on terrorism, the Abu Ghraib. Everyone uh, boiled down their uh, criticism of U.S. foreign policy, uh, not to any of those issues, but to the question of Palestine. They say if you ever want a good relationship between the East and the West, or the Arabs and America, you need to be uh, fair uh, and you need to uh, help the Palestinians achieve a homeland uh, uh, and uh, have uh, their rights restored. Uh, Samar, do, do Arabs understand the war and terrorism in the same scope that the Americans do? I mean, do, do they have the same position for terrorism between the two people? Can you hear me? Samar, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, do, do, like, Arabs understand the term terrorism and the war on terror in the same scope that uh, Americans do? I'm not sure if even Americans understand because there is no definition of terrorism and uh, it's very vague and in the point of view, you know, Arabs are not, uh, they're different, uh, they all think differently, they're not all uh, one kind of people. You will be surprised to see a lot of variety and differences of opinion, uh, a lot of spice. Uh, the Arabs see, uh, and I cannot generalize, but at least the people I met with, that uh, terrorism uh, is being addressed as if it's the only Arab uh, terrorism uh, or uh, if, uh, if it is done by a Muslim. However, you have the Tamil in Sri Lanka, you have uh, the, um, the, you know, uh, like Timothy McVeigh in America. Uh, the term terrorism uh, has not been identified or defined uh, to keep uh, this uh, uh, label uh, to be used anytime whenever somebody in power wants to use it against uh, somebody else. Okay. So there is a difference in the Arab world. They see it that you know America uses that in order to pursue its policies that it cannot uh, pursue otherwise. Okay, there, there's an interesting uh, in, in some of these responses that some of them even think that Osama bin Laden is a myth created by the United States. How this idea that Osama bin Laden is a myth? Uh, how how wide is it in the in the Arab world? Uh, one uh, particular person in my book uh, says that, and he he does uh, a lot of TV shows, 
and uh, he sees how the technology, uh, for instance, how you can erase my voice or lower it or improve the quality. So he says when you work uh, at a radio station and a TV station and you can see the billions uh, of uh, machines and when you think uh, of the phenomena of this uh, man who lives in a cave and can do all these uh, things and uh, the superpower of the world cannot reach to him, uh, he says maybe this is uh, fictitious. Uh, there are many people, for instance, there who would repeat some of the you know rumors and things that uh, really do not uh, qualify even to be a rumor. But uh, that attitude is uh, changing, uh, especially, um, I think, maybe uh, significantly, I would say, after the latest uh, bombing uh, in Jordan uh, at that wedding. I would think that that was a turning point in many people's thinking that uh, really it doesn't matter even if uh, Osama bin Laden is a fictitious uh, entity or not. Uh, there is uh, and there are uh, people out there uh, who would use terrorism and uh, scaring people and blowing uh, people uh, attending a wedding uh, uh, because of revenge or differences of opinion. Okay. Um, in, uh, again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the book is uh, Arab Voices Speak to American Hearts. Um, now, it sounds, when I read a title like that, Summer, I know you know you don't want to apologize for anything that you did not do and I understand that position and I appreciate it but when you are with a title like that don't you think that's trying to say uh, please don't punish me for what somebody else did no I have no idea how you got uh, this idea because I say in my book I have not uh, done anything to apologize for um, you know, so no, I don't, <laughs> I don't see that uh, whatsoever. Uh, there okay. is nothing. Uh, because to me, I when see. somebody is speaking to my heart, they're trying to get me to forgive them for something. That's not. No, because I have had people come to my classes where they had uh, no heart when they talk to me and talk about the Arabs and talk uh, about uh, the uh, Muslims, for instance. And it takes me, what, an hour uh, to open his heart and let him start to see that I am a human. I can, uh, you know, disagree totally with him politically uh, and uh, on uh, religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, belief. But again, we can uh, we can reach each other, we can uh, respect each other, and see the humanity uh, of other. I, I I don't think we can live without our hearts, and I don't see. I I, I mean, I didn't even dwell on the idea of heart and mind. Um, you know, uh, it's something that I sent to so many friends and uh, uh, editors, and we all ended up with this has nothing to do with my background. Uh, because I am an American, after all. Okay. Um, now, Samar, in one of you, uh, the book reviews uh, that you have posted on your blog, one is by Nassim Tarawne, and uh, in, in his review, uh, he's saying, he's talking about uh, Ola, a 44-year-old uh, attorney uh, in Amman, and he's saying that, uh, at the end, he's saying that a woman who is religious and veiled is therefore without education and oppressed. He's saying that the, the view of most Americans about a veiled woman as being uneducated and oppressed. Uh, do you agree with his assessment that Americans view veiled women as uneducated and oppressed? Because this really, uh, when I read this, it, it offended me because I, I don't think Americans look at veiled women as uneducated and oppressed. Uh, do you agree with this assessment? There are, uh, Nassim actually lives in Canada and he is doing his masters there and he has a very famous blog uh, that, uh, you know, um, mainly in Jordan but everywhere you can access it. 
And I think, uh, yes, from uh, people who ask the questions, and if you look at the questions related to women, most of it uh, are questions where you would assume that the, the women uh, do not fare very well in the psychic of uh, Americans. I mean, I go to places and people uh, still ask me uh, if uh, Arab women are allowed to get an education. And, you know, they're not thinking that, hey, I am an Arab woman and I'm speaking a different language. How many languages do you speak? Uh, you the person who asked me the question. So yes, there are many instances where I was asked questions that your mom might be offended uh, about, uh, you know, if she is allowed to do this and do that. Then when I tell them, for instance, uh, how many uh, privileges I have just for the fact that I am a Muslim, uh, whether my equality with Adam, whether that I am not responsible for uh, his sin, uh, whether uh, divorce, inheritance, marriage, and uh, uh, all that, people start to shift the gears immediately and start to look, okay, why do we have this bias? And then I start to tell them, well, uh, for two reasons, you do not read and you uh, believe whatever you uh, uh, listen to or watch uh, on television or uh, movies. But you have to understand, Hisham, that uh, the Arabs and the Muslims came to this country with Christopher Columbus. And there is no excuse for us that today we should point fingers at Americans and say why they don't know much about Arab culture, why they don't know much about uh, Muslims. It, we are at fault uh, also. Uh, the, where have the, the Arab Americans and Arab Muslim uh, and Muslim Americans have been a hundred years ago and a hundred and fifty years ago? Most of them changed their first names and last names. Ali became Al, and then Muhammad became Mo, and uh, disappeared and were afraid of uh, our culture. So I don't like the attitude of always blaming the American for not opening a history book and learning about me. What have I done? to make an American uh, know and be curious about uh, uh, my uh, culture and my, uh, okay. my heritage. Uh, speaking, uh, Samar, speaking, speaking of, of, of Islam, uh, also uh, Nassim uh, talking about you interviewing the 43-year-old Khalid from Cairo. I'm assuming that was Amr Khalid? No, it was not him. It was not, okay. B because what he said is like uh, he's a preacher and uh, his, uh, he likes his voice, uh, and lifestyle represent the most moderate version of Islam. Uh, can you tell me what is he talking about here? Uh, the most uh, modern version of Islam, and he's talking about the style, the, I guess the way he's dressed. Uh, do I assume that he's dressed in, in, in Western suit? No, uh, that's uh, Dr. Khaled. I think he was doing his PhD when I interviewed him in the last stages of Okay, his PhD. But, but what I want to what I want to really uh, 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 ask you about is. He's saying the most moderate version of Islam. Do we have like an old version and a, and a, and a most moderate? And then if we wear Western clothes, that makes us a, a modern Muslims? No, actually, uh, Dr. Khalid is uh, pictured in the photo, in the book, with his traditional uh, alim or, you know, azhari uh, dress. So it is not, uh, he's not wearing a suit. It is what uh, Dr. Khalid says. For instance, uh, he plays uh, several instruments. Uh, he likes uh, music, and people assume that, you know, uh, preachers or imams or uh, people of, uh, of uh, uh, preachers uh, of of Islam do not necessarily uh, appreciate the music and you will have uh, some religious people who will tell you uh, music is not uh, uh, allowed uh, you know in the home or uh, to be a singer or whatever and again Dr. Khalid for instance sends his two daughters uh, to a Catholic school and when I asked him why do you do that uh, and he says because uh, there is no fear from my uh, perspective from Khalid's perspective that his daughters will be uh, you know converted or anything they have a very solid strong uh, upbringing at the home and he says the Catholic schools are known to be the best in the Arab world in terms of discipline and education and uh, openness so I guess this is how, why Khaled uh, the preacher the evangelical actually because he has a TV show where he talks about Islam uh, is a modern uh, version that uh, I'm sure that you know in, in, in the uh, US media uh, any preacher of Islam is always portrayed as if he is closed-minded, not willing to dialogue with the other, uh, not educated, and does not play three instruments and play sports.
Okay. So this is how Khaled, for instance, uh, was impressive uh, to uh, that uh, uh, um, book reviewer. And the owner was impressive because not of the, the fact that she is wearing uh, her uh, hair cover, but because she is a lawyer and she deals with uh, law cases that deals with Christian women, Christian Arab women who have major difficulty getting divorces uh, under uh, the religious um, church rules. So she is uh, a Muslim uh, uh, covered uh, lawyer who goes in front of, uh, in front of uh, priests in the church trying to argue uh, for the woman's right uh, to divorce. So these things, you know, humanizes the uh, Arab-Christian relations, um, humanizes the Arab uh, and shows the variety and the spice out there in the Arab world, uh, unlike what okay. the images on uh, American TV. Okay. Uh, Very good. Uh, 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 Samar, we're going to go to the phones. And ladies and gentlemen, if you are, uh, we have an open line now. So if you want to call, go ahead and do it now. Uh, we go on to Vic on line one. Go ahead, Vic. Hello. Yes, hi, Vic. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I am one of those ignorant persons you talked about with regard to Arab history. And I'm wondering if either of you could say something about the the Battle of um, Aleppo, Aleppo, I think it is. It took place um, in the Middle Ages. Are you familiar with that word? Aleppo? Aleppo, yes. Summer? <laughs> Aleppo in Halab, you mean? I, I guess Aleppo, Halab, but I don't know. Uh, uh, Vic, uh, what was it, uh, who was it between and what happened? Well, uh, according to a friend, it was a historic battle when the Muslims drove the Christians from the uh, city in, in Syria. It's an ancient city in Syria. Yeah, Aleppo, Aleppo is, uh, oh, is yes. a city in, uh, in Syria, yes. 4,000 years old. Well, it couldn't be 4,000 uh, years old because Islam is only 1,400 years old, Vic. Oh, oh well, anyway, I looked in the Webster's uh, encyclopedia here and it said that it's a historic uh, city there. Well, it is, a, by the way, uh, uh, Aleppo is a very old city, uh, is a very historic city, but uh, Islam is only 1,400 years old, so I'm not really sure. And to be, to be honest with you, I'm not, a, I'm not aware of that particular battle. Oh, okay. Well,. Yeah. Anyway, it, it tied into 9-11 because the historic battle took place on 9-11 when the, the defeat uh, occurred. No, it, no, I didn't want to say that Islam is that old, but the city itself is uh, okay. 4,000 years old. Uh, do, you any, do you know any particulars about this particular battle? And uh, besides the date, is there any connection, I mean, you think? Well, when um, the attack in New York took place, uh, on 9/11, 01, it was uh, tied historically to uh, the battle in Alito and whenever it occurred in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Now let me ask you something, Vic. Um, Summer here wrote a book. She feels that if Americans and Arabs start a dialogue between them, that things probably would would turn out to be better than the way uh, the track that we are on now. Uh, how do you feel about that? I like the title of our book, I really do, because <laughs> the longest journey we will ever make in life is to go from the head to the heart. Okay. And, uh, you know, we have to begin with some sense of history, of course. I think of G.B. Shaw, who said, uh, well, here's a quote, Alas, Hegel was right. He said, the only thing we learn from history is that we never learn from history. <laughs> And in terms of warfare, I mean, why do we stand out there every Friday with our, our banner? You know, war never brings peace. It's because we have failed to learn that lesson. Okay. Do you feel that uh, Arabs are your enemy? No, 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 not at all. Okay. I don't. Okay. But if we uh, have that historical knowledge, I mean, the, the history of Kuwait, when I found out that Kuwait, you know, was just like cutting uh, the nose off of uh, Iraq, if we would take uh, an area in Houston, for example, and say, well, we're cutting off that part of the Houston port, some super, super power, just removing the, uh, the port of Houston, there would be an uproar in right. the United States. But right. this is exactly what happened to Iraq. But okay. yet, uh, you know, we know that history, but we don't take it to heart. Okay. Appreciate the call, Vic. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. Greg online, too. Go ahead, Greg. Hello. Hi. How you doing? Uh, look, I just want to thank you for um, having Summer on the um, on the show tonight, and I want to thank her for enlightening us 
because I don't really know a whole lot about Arab culture, but I want to thank her, thank her for uh, enlightening us tonight and letting us know, American people, how Arab peoples really feel. Because it seems like all we get to know is what the news media tell us about what's really going on in that. I think they give us the the perceptive, I think that most Arab people hate America. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I, and, and like I said, uh, excuse me for my ignorance because I don't know a whole lot about Arab culture. You know what I'm saying? But okay. I just want to thank you because I, I, I mean, I was, uh, she had some very interesting things to say and she really enlightened me a lot about, you know, how Arab people feel about America and how uh, Muslims feel and everything because, like I said, I only get the, pre the, the, the perception of what the media tell us, you know, what's going on. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for having her, Appreciate and thank her for coming on and, and letting us know what's going on. Thank you, Greg. All right, thank you. All right, my favorite caller of all time, Eugene, is on the phone. Go ahead, Eugene. How are you doing, Mr. Slowen? I'm doing fine, thank you. Good. We're going to go, have some fun tonight, right? No, no bombs. No bombs. <laughs> no bombs. Okay. Okay, uh... First, uh, when you know you came on uh, about the uh, port deal, sure, uh, and I think that was the numbers you showed of the what is it, British company that run? That's the company that the uh, Dubai uh, Port World has purchased for six point eight billion. Six point eight billion billions, and the company made one hundred and fifty three point eight millions last year. Uh, 2004, the year before. Oh, okay. Well, that sure don't sound like a good deal to me. It's, it's not it's much not. much return on your money, is it? Uh, it's it's not. It's not a good deal. But they inflated the uh, uh, the price, though. Well, why would uh, UAE good. want to pay billions for something that's only going to return a hundred? some million dollars a year. I mean, that's, that don't make sense. It, it does not make sense. It's, I mean, I'm not a businessman myself, but yeah. I can see that that's, that's a crappy deal. It is. It is a crappy deal. Uh, you know, looking at it financially, it is a crappy deal. Well, how else would you look at it? It's well, not a Trojan horse, is it? Okay, I mean, I, I see where you're going with this. Uh, no, I mean, mean, that's as far as I'm going, but okay. I mean, I'm really serious. I want to understand this. That's why I watch you. And I mean, you've been having a little go around for a while, and you told me you're going. <laughs> by, to the way, people, by the you way, by the way, Eugene, people me. people think that 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 uh, you are part of the show because of what me and you go through uh, every time you call. Uh, but it looks like this time we uh, we both going to be uh, civil from now on with each other. Uh, Eugene, I don't really understand uh, uh, the deal either, and I can tell you one thing: if Rush Limbaugh defending this deal. I have to be worried because Rush Limbaugh has been doing nothing but spewing, spew, spewing hate against uh, Muslims and Arabs. And uh, it makes me wonder. Now, when I found out who, who actually owned Peninsular and Oriental, that's P&O, that's when I began to understand the deal uh, better because what I really think is just uh, some Jewish investors want it to make a lot of money and our government okay, is helping them. I'm not worried they, about, about the security deal. I'm not worried about because secu right. the security does not rest with the company that's unloading the ships. It rests with the, with the coast guards. It rests with the uh, customs. It rests with the, uh, coast, uh, with the uh, uh, homeland Correct. security. Yeah. So I'm not worried about security when it comes. And they're not buying the ports, by the way. No one can, uh, can buy the ports. They are buying a business that has contracts with several ports to unload and load up ships. That, that's all the, the contract is. Right. I understand that. But you just said that you think there's Jewish people behind this and doing all that. Is that what you think? Or do no, you no, no. have that's, any, the, any, any no, the fact, proof the fact, of that? No, the fact. Well, yeah, yeah. I I mean, the, proof, the proof is right there. Just all you have to do is look at the owners of P&O and look at the investors. Uh, Zim's shipping out of Israel is a, is a major investor in P&O. Uh, I'll tell you what, uh, Summer, do you, do you, do you want to jump in here on, uh, about this uh, deal? No, I had a, a question for... Uh, okay, go ahead, ask your question. What's her name, Samar Jair? Uh, Summer. Summer, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, Miss Summer, I was listening to you a while ago, and you were talking about how the Americans don't... Uh, 
uh, I mean, we see everything in black and white, and that the Americans don't understand, but that's my whole point. Uh, Americans do see things in black and white, because when you get into the gray area, gray is a mixture of that, it confuses, it confounds, okay. it distorts. Uh, Eugene, go ahead and ask, go ahead and ask the question. Okay. Uh, You're making question. a comment. Go ahead and ask a question. Okay, what? But she had posed some questions about the uh, the veil worn by the by the uh, Arab women. We think just women can't drive and they can't choose their husbands and they're stoned if they just okay. grace their families to death. Uh, okay, uh, I Eugene. really don't believe. Okay, you just said. Okay, uh, but, what, what you just said is very good because a lot of people are saying that. Some are you still with me? Yeah. yeah, I am here. Okay. Uh, you know, people think that women are oppressed in, in the Muslim world, that they can't drive, they can't choose their husbands, they can't do this and they can't do that. Can you enlighten uh, Eugene on what exactly, how, let's take for instance Jordan. Tell me about women in Jordan. Uh, well, hold on Jordan, Eugene, Eugene, looking... Eugene, hold on, hold on. Go ahead, okay. Thank you, Eugene, uh, hold on, she's answering. Hold on, Eugene, go ahead, Summer. Okay, thank you, Eugene, for uh, asking uh, all these uh, questions, and I don't generalize. I don't say all Americans or all Arabs, but a lot of different things in black One and white. One call on hold. To reconnect, press the hold key. To transfer, press 3. For more information, press star. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, do, okay. So, uh, for instance, the only country in the world where it says women cannot drive, actually two places, one in Saudi Arabia and one is in, in New York. I forgot the name of the area, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, some type of a Jewish uh, area where women cannot drive. They have to be driven by their husbands. Uh, but again, uh, for instance, uh, Catholic nuns uh, cover their hair. Nobody points fingers at them and say, uh, you know, they are uneducated or unsophisticated. Actually, Islam is the only uh, religion that grants women the right to divorce their husbands, uh, their right to inheritance, uh, the right to own uh, property, uh, and... Um, really uh, Arab uh, women and Muslim women and women in general, they do have a problem sometimes uh, uh, because of uh, culture. Look at the USA uh, with all our sophistication and uh, civility and constitutional law. We, ha we are yet to see an American president, female American president, yet look at uh, Turkey, which is a Muslim country, look at uh, Indonesia, look at uh, Pakistan. All these are Muslim countries and they are way ahead of us when it comes uh, to uh, women becoming prime ministers and leaders so one need, need not look at uh, my uh, my dress and judge me because of it and I always find it interesting Hisham that people respect uh, women uh, when they are naked and respect them less uh, when they are conservative in dress <laughs> there okay. is something wrong in that formula okay uh, we, we're going to have to uh, cut it short, uh, Summer, because we have a lot of callers and we only have like six minutes left. Uh, I'm going to go on to line one with a caller. Go ahead, caller. Hello? Yes. Hello, Dr. Tilawi? Yes, hi. hi. I was just going to congratulate you on the show. It is a very good show and a lot of my friends watch it too all the time, every week. Thank you. And uh, I, can I make a comment? Sure, go ahead. The only thing I wanted to say is, you you always yelling and you're always angry. Why are you always yelling and mad all the time? Why am I always yelling? Yes. I'm not yelling now. But you, always, every week, you always be yelling. Well, you want me to yell at you now? Okay, we're going to Joel on two. Go ahead, Joel. Hello, sir. Hey, how are you? I don't hear you yelling all the time. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, listen. I, w I wanted to agree with 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 your co with your guest. Okay. Uh, the nuns, you know, the the nuns are uh, pretty pretty uh, dressed, covered. Their heads are covered. You know, you see a lot of times. I can remember my great aunt. You know, they wore veils and they wore head coverings. They, you know, a lot of times 
you know, why don't we just tell the truth what it's all about? It's about modesty, which I think America, due to the fact of Hollywood, has turned our society into an immodest uh thinking society where if a man decides if a woman uh, uh, covers herself or dresses properly where you can't nothing is revealed on her body well there's something wrong with that that she's being oppressed in some way shape or form you know it's i think it's we're being brainwashed with by hollywood with the Britney Spears and the, uh, Christina Aguilera's and, and all these other women, you know, the hula hooping and they pumping and gyrating. But yet, if, if they see uh, another woman of another uh, nationality or from another country and she's fully clothed, her body is not revealing, you know, anything, she's very modestly dressed. Uh, her body is for the eye, it belongs to her husband. The, the, her body is it's for her husband's eyes only. But America, we have gotten away, because now we're, you know, if you think like that, or you dress modestly, or you dress properly, you somehow, now you're, you're, you're labeled as old-fashioned. But, you know, old-fashioned was not so bad at one time with our grandparents and our, our you know, the, our, 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 our great-grandparents. They tried to teach us modesty and to be proper and honest. And you know, uh, Joel, uh, you know, uh, just only a few years ago, even in this country, you could not go to a church if you were not covering your hair. That's exactly and, right. And that's why older women right now, when they go to church, they always cover their hair. And uh, you could not get into a church if you, if you did not cover your hair. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, Summer, any comments? No, actually, uh, the three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, ask both men and women to be modest in their dress. It's just us here in the West have parted from uh, the faith. Uh, you know, uh, but, but the Bible says very clearly that women uh, should not raise their voices actually in the church and that they should cover their uh, hair. And that's why men, uh, when they go to synagogues uh, in the Jewish uh, temple, they also cover uh, their hair or wear the uh, yamaka. But I think uh, the gentleman... Uh, Joel, you have any question? Nail, well, it's just, and, again, you know, he's so concerned about the, 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 the Muslim women that are, be, you know, you hear the callers and they act like they're so uh, concerned about a Muslim woman being oppressed. Well, I don't know, how come they don't have that same concern about a Catholic nun that is dressed in the same fashion, is walking around with her body fully covered and her head fully covered, and, and you know, she's never talking, she's never, you know, you don't see her in the limelight, she's not uh, dictating to the priest what his duty should be. I mean, it seems like they're kind of like in the background, but I don't see all the Catholics, you know, running to say that uh, the nuns are being uh, oppressed in any way, shape, or form. You know, I just, it, it's a double standard, and that's, that's all I'm hearing. Okay. It, it's a double standard. It, it's about modesty. That's what it is. It's about modesty, and these women, they're, they're modest, and, and this is for, for their husband. They, they have right. a, a loyalty and an honesty and a modesty for their husbands. Plain and simple. Wow. Our country seems to have lost that with the tight-fitting clothes, the tight-fitting pants, you know, the low-cut uh, shirts, and, and our children. I mean, look how our children are dressing today. I mean, we are actually losing it, but yet we're all concerned about uh, another nation's women because they're modest and, and they're honor you know, they're being honored by their husbands. They honor their husbands in okay. the way they dress. Uh, and Joel, so. we, uh, I'm going to have to uh, cut it uh, right oh, here. And that's all I want to say. I appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Summer, uh, we only have one minute left. I just want to say uh, thank you very much for being with us. It has been uh, a great experience uh, for me and I'm sure for a lot of uh, the viewers out there. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we have like 30 seconds if you would like to say something. No, Hisham, but uh, thank you so much for having me. And I think uh, it's, it's about time that uh, Arabs and Americans start to talk uh, directly to each other and start to understand each other. They don't necessarily have to like each other, but at least uh, understand. And uh, people okay. can go to my website, ArabVoicesSpeak.com, and engage in the debate. And Very good. Very good. We're going to have to leave it at there, ladies and gentlemen. We will be back here in five minutes. Be back for the second hour with Bradley. Smith. Thank you again for being with us. We'll see you in five minutes.